they really live their around this stuff really, really real or whatever. You don't really get studio gangsters from New Orleans like talking about it. Kill New Orleans. Many cities in the United States have seen a dramatic rise in their homicide rate. Here at home, an up and coming New Orleans rapper shot and killing more about the someone opened fire with the rap artist. Yella and Baby had a, had a physical fight. Yella did actually go to his house looking for him and, you know, shut the house. Bad Yella boy, all six in Barone. The third wall you see. Uh, uh. I remember one story, man. Yella boy pulled up. I was going to high school. I was catching a bus. I ain't had no car, nothing. So they were like, man, yellow boy out there, you know what I'm saying? All the while I'm thinking, you know what I'm saying? They 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 mad because ain't about you and LV no more. So yellow boy out there, I'm hiding in the hallway. To be out of his mind, all he doing, the all all and the, all these weird things, man. A lot of them straight from the originator, yellow boy himself. New Orleans, the city that never closes, is known for its food, Mardi Gras, 24-hour party scene. and mean, grimy streets. These mean, grimy streets will give birth to UNLV, Cash Money Records' first gangster rap group. The group would consist of Tech 9 Reginald Manuel, and Lil Yacht, Yafet Jones. This group would later add Albert Thomas, AKA Bash Yellow Boy. The tandem will rap about real life encounters that would include money, guns. The most notable member of the group would be Yella Boy, AKA Yella. Yella would be deeply involved with the streets of New Orleans. Some of the street slang that was created by Yella is still commonly used in the streets of New Orleans today. The third wall you see, ah uh, ah, uh, Mr. Eddie Bow himself dragging from the river. You already know what it is. Used to be out of his mind. All these be doing the all, all, and the all these that slangs, man. A lot of that shit comes straight from the originator, Yellow Boy himself, man. Before UNLV would part ways with Cash Money Records, Yellow would get into a physical confrontation with one of its founding members, Brian Baby Williams, over royalties owed. This confrontation would later lead to Yellow cleaning up Baby's house. Well, Yellow and baby had a had a physical fight uh during the uptown for life period you know we were shooting a video for uptown for life they had a physical fight they got into a whoop -whoop. you know that shit was squashed a couple of weeks later you know before as uh the the pistol whipping and all that, that's, that's rumors man yellow did okay. actually yellow did actually go to his house looking for him and you know house it. Yellow Boy would ride the mean streets of New Orleans in his new Isuzu Trooper, getting into all kind of street. I remember that boy spinning around the windows down, roll up a hundred dollar bill, hitting out the silver pack. You feel what I'm saying? Feeling himself, got the music blasting. He big old lordy with the with the little small frames on. Look with the little pump, the little ramp pump, do with the S curl at the top, bucking. You hear me? But Yellow Boy shot up Birdman's house. Yeah. Whatever, that's just like some, some angry, you know, if he was pissed off, something went on with him and baby, and he went and shot up the house in the car. Okay, I mean, but once you do that, now you're escalating things to a whole different level with somebody. Yeah. Once that happened, did, did anyone from Cash Money retaliate? Did, did the beef? Nah, I mean after that situations. After that they talked and he he done I mean uh the whole thing was behind a royalty. It is alleged that Cash Money Records would have problems paying their artists ever since the beginning, which is what caused the initial confrontation between Yellow Boy and Baby. Other New Orleans local talent would speak up on Cash Money's reluctancy to pay their talent. 
Cash Money was doing this thing at Big Easy called uh, Cash Money Fridays at the Big Easy. And then um, it was like, if you win three times in a row, you get an opportunity to get a deal with Cash Money. So before Big Boy was even established, we had an opportunity to get a deal with okay. Cash Money. So we won it three times. That's when Cash Money was at the Gas and Light Building right on Barome in, in the um, CBD area. So we go over there to um, check them out. We're on the bus and everything like that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? RT, bro. Yeah. So we catch the bus from the east up there. We go we go to meet them. And, uh, you know, we make, you know, Cash Money over there. And they had Yellow and Pimp Daddy and, you know, Big Heavy all was in there. And uh, Yellow had uh, raised his hand and was like, look, bro, you know, y'all trying to sign all these new, you know, uh, when we gonna get paid for Six and Barone? That was a red flag for me, you know what I'm saying? Cause uh, that, was, that was about my paper. Yellow boy, a dude from the streets with a thin, would not let baby from cash money slide without paying his money. It is alleged and rumored that Yellow Boy would do continuous attacks towards baby of cash money records behind the money that he was owed for his royalties. It wouldn't be much longer before Yellow would be found shot in the head in his Isuzu Trooper on one of the dope sets in New Orleans trenches. The streets of New Orleans were buzzing with rumors as to who pulled the trigger on Yella. It was alleged that a hitman for hire had taken out the badass Yella boy. This still remains a cold case to this day. There were no arrests made. There was no retaliation that took place in the death of bad yellow boy the internet would be undefeated as rumors would circulate that brian baby williams song what happened to that boy was aimed at yellow boy no yeah took to social media to shut down those rumors let's take a look at what Lil yeah had to say yellow boy who is in the group gets and, and all these are, are unsolved there was lots of rumors about about who the boy um, uh, you know, we're not going to get into who, who said what, who did what, but, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of people are going to be looking at people you were beefing with, you're going to be looking at, you know, the label that you were beefing with, you're going to talk about everything else like that, but ultimately we, we, we don't know. Well, there was a rumor that Birdman's, uh, song, What Happened to That Boy, was a reference to, to Yellow do you believe that? I can't believe that shit, man. I can't believe that. Did you talk to Birdman after all that happened? Yeah, I talked to Birdman a few times after that happened. That's the code of the streets. Live by by. It's a dirty world, but it still spins. At the end of the day, what happens in the streets stays in the streets. There still has been no evidence as to who may have taken the life of Jello Boy. Rumors continue to circulate. Fingers continue to be pointed. But at the end of the day, no one has a clear explanation as to who assassinated Yella. Was it his mini beef from the streets? Was it just a coincidence? Some sort of robbery? Was he beefing with someone on the dope set? Who knows? We definitely don't. Battle Boy will forever be a New Orleans street legend. On November 26, 2003, James Tapp, also known as Soldier Slim, was right here in New Orleans. As you can see, we're in the noise. One, two, three. M A G N O L I A. Don't get involved in the foolishness, level. I'm trying to tell you what's happening right now. You know, well, you understand. I'm gonna do my thing. You understand what I'm saying? And keep it real. You know me. You, know, you got the label popping up. Cut those yeah, cut those committed. Yeah, it's official now. You heard me? Crucial in New Orleans, man. You understand what I'm saying? The little past nine, was on the shit. James. <laughs> the little past nine, it falls out here off the pole. Gangster. James Tap, aka 
Soldier Slim, born September 9th, 1977, to Linda Tapp in New Orleans, Louisiana, November 26, 2003, survived by sister Danielle Porter and his two sons, was one of the realest to ever step foot out of the Noya. Born in Uptown New Orleans, going back and forth from the Noya to the Parkways, Slim will be no stranger to the street life. In his teen years, up to his early 20s, Slim would fight being on both that boy and that girl, hitting licks, pulling off jack moves, and getting into all kinds of street beefs. Slim will solidify himself as a certified gangster. Yeah, straight up. Hey, what are you talking about? Slim passed 94 off the post a gangster. It was rereaded and weak. One of Slim's first local rap hits was Snorted Powder Bag, which he would rock clubs and bars with. Slim would do a joke and upon his release, signed with No Limit Records. This relationship wouldn't last long as Slim would feel that Pete was playing with the money. Slim would take it back to the streets and launch his own record label, Cut Throat Committee Records. You understand me? Understand me, man. You got the label popping up, Cut Throat yeah, Committee. Yeah, Cut Throat Committee. Yeah, it's official now. You heard me? Slim would still be in the streets and continue to pull off acts. Slim would rap about these acts in the lyrics of his songs, rapping word for word about an act that he pulled off in his song, If It's Beef, would it literally cause him to lose his life. Slim gave full details about a kidnapping that he and his cutthroat homies had pulled off. A hook will be put out on Slim and he will be taken out in front of his mother's home on November 26, 2003. There was a huge second line for Slim's funeral the entire New Orleans would attend. It wouldn't be long before Slim being crushed would be retaliated against. Jarrell Jigga Smith would be initially arrested for the crime, but would later be released. That same year, Jigga would be arrested again for deleting Spencer Smith Jr. Jigga would again be released. In 2007, Jigga would be arrested for crushing Mandel Duplessis and would again be released. It is rumored that Jigga wasn't alone on the Soldier Slim hit. His partner in crime would be S.K. Kennedy. They would allegedly both be trigger man on the hit. Stephen S.K. Kennedy would be deleted in Houston, Texas as retaliation for going with the move on Soldier Slim. All right. What happened? So as he's telling me the story, a guy named Steve from out the Seventh War reached, coming in while he reached for the door and man shot him in the head. Rumors would circulate online that Jigger was solely responsible for Slim. There would be multiple YouTube videos chronicling the story that either told half truth, got the story entirely wrong, or that didn't know about SK's involvement. In New Orleans, there are steppers from every hood, uptown, downtown, West Bank, and the East. Darrell Jigger Smith would ultimately end up meeting his faith. Jigger will be found crushed in the 3500 block of Hamburg, the very same hood that he will wreak havoc in. New Orleans, Louisiana, known for its strong hurricanes and not just the drink. The Inu underwent two of the most devastating hurricanes in Louisiana history. Betsy, September 9th, 1965, Category 4 storm with winds reaching 140 miles per hour. Katrina, August 29th, 2005, Category 3 storm with winds reaching 125 miles per hour, causing over $108 billion in damage, displacing residents. New Orleans would bounce back. So would its mean, grimy streets. Michael Allen, a.k.a. V.L. Mike, born January 19, 1976, son of Yvette and Michael Ray Allen Sr., came up in a UPT, Uptown, New Orleans. Initially living in the 17th Ward as a young child, he would later relocate to the 13th. Mike, who didn't drink or smoke, was a live wire who would crash out at the drop of a dime. Known for being a street dude, Mike would slide through from hood to hood. Although from the streets, Mike had a talent. 
that talent was rapping. Mike would spit gritty garment lyrics from the street. It is these lyrics that will grab the attention of Christopher Dorsey, a.k.a. B. Jizzle. In 2003, BG would sign an independent deal for Chopper City Records with Koch Records. It was then BG would form the Chopper City Boys. The group would consist of BG's younger brother, Hakizel, Gar, and Snipe. DL Mike would join the group in early 2004. The Chopper City Boys had been featured on BG's solo albums as well as several mixtapes between 2003 and 2006. The Chopper City Boys released their debut album, We Got This, in 2007. The Chopper City Boys' first single, Make Em Mad, would be produced by David Banner. The debut album will go on to sell 36,000 units independently its first week. The Chopper City Boys and Chopper City Records would seem to be on their way. They would go on a national promotional tour to promote the album. This will be before the rise of social media. The Chopper City Boys were interviewed with several of the largest hip hop platforms in the industry, even having a freestyle session on the basement. You see me on Rap City, you heard of the truth. Before the deal would be signed, Chopper City Records in the label of James Tapp, aka Soldier Slim, Cut Throat Committee Records would have the streets on fire with mixtapes. In 2005, Hurricane Katrina would make landfall in New Orleans. BG would relocate the Chopper City Records imprint to Detroit, but later move the label back to Louisiana. BG's roster would complete their contracts with Koch in 2007. BG would partner with T.I. and sign a solo deal with Atlantic Records. Christopher Dorsey, a.k.a. BG, was finally starting to see some real bread. With the success of the label on the rise, BG was seen to be back. Jizzle had taken a group of dudes from the streets to be recognized nationwide. With this amount of success and such little time, you would think that everyone would be happy, right? In a perfect world, this answer would be yes. However, this would not be the case as Michael Allen, a.k.a. P.L. Mike, would not be happy at all. With Mike's dissatisfaction, he would launch a hate campaign against Jizzle. Let's rewind. The year is 2004. Michael Allen, 28 years old at the time, was an inspiring rapper from New Orleans. Mike would launch his career as a rapper under the stage name VL Mike. Mike would get the opportunity he was looking for when he was made a member of the Chopper City Boys, a group put together by Christopher Dorsey, aka BG. The Chopper City Boys would go on to release their debut album. Not happy with the money, Mike would take to the streets to disrespect BG. What started as just talking shit would turn into Mike's vlogging in the street of the NO. This would not be a good look as Mike would go from hood to hood disrespecting Jizzle. It is rumored that the entire time Mike was putting off these antics, he was still being cordial with Miss Sin, BG's mother. BG would go on record saying that the disagreement between him and VL Mike was minor and would end peacefully. Mike would not feel the same way as he would go on to record a diss track on Jizzle and perform it at local shows, one of which BG would show up to. Jizzle being a legend in the game and former member of the super group, the original Hot Boys would not be affected by this hate campaign. Mike's barrage of insults would do nothing to hurt BG career or street cred. Ultimately, Jizzle would let Mike out of his contract. It is rumored that Mike had several deals on the table, including affiliation with the game's Black Wall Street label. Upon Mike being released from his contract, rumor would circulate that this beef had been taken to the streets. It wouldn't be long before Mike's life would be taken. April 20th, 2008, Mike would be in the Gentilly area of the city. He would pull up to the 4700 block of Miles Drive at or about roughly 1 p.m. From out of nowhere, as Mike was getting out of his whip, shots would ring out. He would be approached and shot by an unidentified man. The man would flee the scene on feet. Michael would be taken to University Hospital where he would later die. At this time, Michael murder remains unsolved. It is unknown if Michael was targeted or his murder was random. No motive has ever been discovered. The year is 2009. Prior to relocating back to the NO, BG had been arrested two different times on gun charges in Detroit. 
Through the naked eye, this arrest was seen to be random cases where BG was just caught slipping with the blicky. Unbeknownst to Jizzle, he was being investigated by the feds. BG would later find out that he was under investigation in several different states that he frequented. In November of 09, Jizzle would relocate back to the city. His two hood to be Hollywood album release party was slated to take place at the Chocolate Bar Friday night on November 6th. On the night of November 3rd, BG would be arrested along with Demon Pollard, aka Moni, and Gerard Fettison, aka Fetty, on felony weapons charges. BG's team would spend the entire week trying to bond him out. It is alleged that no one knew that BG had been arrested. This would be pretty much impossible as the arrest made the national and local news. If you want to state the claim that no one knew if he had bonded out, that would be safe to say. BG would ultimately end up bonding out the night of the party with enough time to attend, being that the chocolate bar is directly across the street from the jailhouse. New Orleans, home of Marie Laveau. Twenty-four hour to go daiquiri, cafe Dumont, beignets. Cubic pies. And second line, Sundays. The NO has also been tagged as the capital of the world. Derek Leon Williams, son of Dorothy Harris and Benny Butler Jr. was born December 15, 1980. Named after Mrs. Dorothy's uncle, the newborn Derek would be his mother's pride and joy. As an infant, Derek and Miss Dorothy would reside in Alexandria, Louisiana for a short stint, but would later relocate to the 10th Ward in New Orleans, Louisiana. Derek would still be a toddler when his father would be sentenced to 10 years in Angola. This will leave the very proud and strong Miss Darty to play the role of both mother and father. Yam will play a huge role in Derek's life. Far from shy, the young Derek was outspoken and wouldn't hesitate to speak his mind. Derek was musically inclined at a young age and would learn to play a full set of drums early in his life. Derek would come up masking Indian as an adolescent running flag boy. If you know anything about masking Indian, you would know that your wordplay had to be aggressive and on point. It was these skills that would later play a part in Derek's rap style. Contrary to popular belief and other videos on the topic, Derek is not out the Thomas, nor has he or Miss Darty ever lived in the STP. Derek would hang and do his thing in the Thomas, but would be respected throughout the entire uptown area. Always wanted to be aware of who was around him. If he didn't check your temperature himself, he would send somebody else on a mission to do it. Derek was a smooth talking ladies man that was always fly, who wasn't afraid of letting you know it. Revered by friends and family as someone that would give you the shirt off his back, Derek would be recognized as a good dude. 
known for having an instigative sense of humor, Derek would drive you if you let him, aka put that will in your back. Derek's biggest talent would be spitting game, aka rapping, which he would develop a strong passion for. His flamboyant yet witty lyrics would set him aside from his peers. Miss Darty Harris, mother of LaDerek, was also sister to Brian Williams, a.k.a. Birdman, and Ronald Williams, a.k.a. Slim, of Cash Money Records. Although not raised together, they would all still recognize each other as family. Miss Darty would be closer to her sister Kim than she was with Ronald and Brian. These blood ties would obviously make Derek, Baby, and Slim's nephew. Promises from Baby that he would put Derek on his feet made Derek Williams, a.k.a. Bulletproof, go even harder with his music. Derek would have dreams and aspirations of taking Miss Darty out of the hood. Derek would often share his sentiments with his mom. Miss Darty, frustrated with the dreams being sold to her son, would be vocal about her lack of confidence in Baby and Slim to put Derek on his feet. Miss Darty was confident that Derek would be successful without the help of Cash Money Records. Derek would idolize and look up to his uncle Baby, giving himself the name the number two stunner. This would be well deserved as Derek was known for throwing money at clubs and rocking the newest iceberg gear, which was the hottest thing smoking at the time. At the age of 19, Lil Derek would be pushing a white vet in Harley Davidson Tuck through the main streets of the Inno, always making sure to show off his mouth full of slugs. Although he would not actually be signed to the label, BG Derek would feature on several songs and would make several cameos in cash money videos. Being deeper in the streets than the artists at the time, Baby would look at Derek as a bad influence. It is rumored that the Derek would encourage the artists to run the streets of Uptown with him, taking away from their studio time. Stunner, who didn't want his artists in the streets, would not like this. It is alleged that a vote will be taken to remove Derek from being a part of the Hot Boys. The vote had been taken, the decision had been made. Baby and Slim will switch up their game and have the artists avoid Derek. They would go as far as going back and forth to different studios to prevent Derek from popping up. Things had changed and Derek knew it. Realizing that he wasn't going to be a part of the Hot Boys, it was time for Derek, who had money of his own, to make a decision. February 2nd, 1999, Deshaun Lewis would launch Smoked Out Records. On August 24th of 1999, Smoked Out Records would release Bustin' Heads and Getting Paid would be these Derek smash hit, Be Honest, and the singles Bustin' Heads and Getting Paid featuring Birdman and Lil Wayne. On June 19, 2001, Smoked Out Records will release Done Did It that featured mega producer Manny Fresh and artists such as Pimp C, Young Buck, Lil Turk, Big Rap, and a repeat of the single Busting Heads and Getting Paid featuring Birdman and Lil Wayne. This run wouldn't last long as Deshaun would get busted. Derek would partner with his homies out the 10th, Sko, Butch, and Chuck to start Knockout Entertainment. The Hood Classic Undisputed Champions will be released on the label. Derek Leon Williams, aka La Derek, aka Bulletproof, aka BG Derek, would not get to enjoy the spoils of his labor as his life will be sadly taken Halloween night of 2002. Cash Money Records would go on to sell over 500 million albums. Birdman, who understood the ever-changing hip-hop game, would start moving outside of the box in 2013. Baby would also launch YMCMB and Rich Gang clothing line that had everyone from Drake to Justin Bieber rocking it. Being in the game for over two decades, CMR is now the biggest rap label in the music industry. Miss Darty will go on to author her first book, The Mother of a Stunner, which can be found on Amazon. A link to Miss Darty's book will be pinned in the comments. You can also still find all of Lil Derek's music online at various outlets, as well as here on the platform 
and various streaming services. And don't forget to check out Miss Dorothy's book on Amazon.com. Link in the description. On December 12, 1989, to Gabriel Jerome and Robert Smith, Desmond would begin rapping at the age of 14. In his adolescent years, Desmond would attend Riverdale High in Jefferson Parish. Mr. Mina, a legend from New Orleans hip-hop scene, would attend high school with Desmond's mom. Watching Desmond grow up in his character neighborhood, Mina would call Desmond Lil D, short for Desmond. This would be well before Desmond would go by the moniker B.T.Y. Youngin. Mina, who would hear Desmond spit at a party being thrown, would instantly recognize his talent. Determined to help the young Desmond escape the grimy streets of the N.O., at the age of 18, Mina and Slim would take Desmond under their wing and mentor him. Later, introducing Desmond to Juvie, who would feature Desmond on his cocky and confident album, that of which he would earn four grand for two verses. Court records would show that Desmond would have arrests in Orleans and Jefferson parishes, dating back to 2007. Those charges would range from selling that hard to an undercover cop with possession of straps, including a second-degree charge that would be played down to a lesser offense. At the age of 16, Desmond would be hit up. Desmond in interviews would admit to wigging off them things while in a rap battle and pulling out his tool. In the street, of the N.O. never pull it if you don't intend on using it. Pulling the blicky would ultimately lead to Desmond being hit up. Despite his buzz on the music scene, Desmond would still be in the streets. In 2008, Desmond would plead guilty to possession in Jefferson Parish and receive two years of probation. The 2011 charge would garner Desmond a five-year bid, which he would be released early on for good behavior. Desmond would attribute his criminal history to being in the streets trying to earn a living after dropping out of high school. It will be those life experiences that Desmond will put into his lyrics. Out to fulfill the promise he made to himself upon the release, Desmond will focus on his rap career. It will be this dedication that will garner the attention of music execs. In 2016, Youngin would win Breakthrough Artist of the Year at the 2016 NOLA Music Awards. Grinding hard, Youngin would drop several music videos and mixtapes, such as the 2016 mixtape I Ain't Sorry for the Wait, a play on a mixtape series that was released by Lil Wayne of Cash Money Records. BTY Youngin was on his way up, linking up with Brian Baby Williams, aka Birdman, to ink a deal with Cash money records. Her man will go on to cameo in several of Youngin's videos. The envy and jealousy will begin to pour in via social media outlets. Youngin will be advised to block all users leaving negative comments. This would only intensify the jealousy. Youngin, who was still living in the hood after gaining acclaim and notoriety in the music industry, would be engulfed in what came with the street life. The at the time 27-year-old BTY Youngin would be on the rise amid a troubled life. He had been in and out of court and jail over the years, but record labels were still calling. Youngin would get back to the community by participating in reality check where he would speak to the youth about his troubled past. Part of growing up in the hoods that Youngin rapped about would also mean brushes with the law. Youngin, who had converted to Islam, would have an entirely new drive and outlook on life. Growing up in not the best of conditions, Youngin reminisced about the good time that he did have coming up as a child, like getting fresh outfits for every holiday. One thing about Youngin, he wasn't selfish. He had always been willing to give back to his people. Desmond Jerome Sr., the artist known and loved by fans as BTY Youngin, would pass Saturday, April 29th of 2017 at the age of 27. Desmond would be shot at 11.15 p.m. on a Saturday night at a gas station in the 9200 block of Airline Highway. Well, a man who was picked as NOLA Music's Breakout Artist of the Year is today being remembered as an up-and-coming rap artist who was devoted to his two-month-old son. Desmond Jerome last night as he went to secure a deal for an upcoming concert. His given name was Desmond Jerome, but as rapper B.T.Y. Young and friends say, he was on the verge of big things. I never was a materialistic individual. Once he started making money off of music, you know, that's all his focus was on. Michael Patterson was a mentor and friend and was shocked to learn Jerome was at 11.15 Saturday night at this gas station in the 9200 block of Airline Highway. In the streets, sometimes when people are trying to you know, get themselves in a better position, you know, some people don't like to see that. 
Our partners at NOLA.com, the Times-Picayune report, Jerome had a history of arrests, including an attempted second degree four years ago. We did it as much as we could do to protect him from being out here in the streets. But his friends say with a two-month-old boy and a promising career, the 27-year-old was turning things around. I remember going to the house one day and he just showed me a box of money he's saving for his kid. He was building a future and everybody around him knew it. In fact, six months ago, Jerome was named Breakthrough Artist of the Year at the NOLA Music Awards. He was being looked at by several major labels, um, including Cash Money. They say Jerome would use his newfound fame to try and help others. And I use Youngin as a guy to kind of tell people that he had been through some tough things and he was getting past that. New Year's Eve this year, he shut down Sector 6 and paid for all the kids in there. Friends say Jerome was picking up a check last night for an upcoming concert and was then heading to the studio when an assailant struck him down. Some of his colleagues were there recording and um, it was just a really grim call. It wasn't what we expected. He was, he, he was a blessed kid. Like, you know, we just, we just got eliminated before he got his shot to show the world what he can actually do. In the end, friends say Jerome couldn't escape the city's mean streets and those who envied his success. I always was concerned about that, um, but it seemed like he was on the upper end of it now. It was, you know, it was just messed up that this happened. They have not released any information on a possible suspect. You know, just to see a young guy that, you know, I had big plans for that, that I thought was about to make a big difference in his life and in his family's life to be laying down and it was like, I was just numb. Michael Patterson is numb after finding out about BTY Young or Desmond Jerome. He's known Jerome before he was even a rapper and Patterson says from an early age, Jerome had it. So when he started rapping for me, I was like, oh, he raw. He just was raw talent. He just was in him rapping nonstop. Like, I mean, balls after balls. Patterson says Jerome was able to paint vivid portraits of life with lyrics. We had a, a thing called Reality Check that we was a part of. And I used to bring Youngin out to go speak to kids, you know what I'm saying? He'd tell the kids about how he got five times. While Patterson says Jerome had a tough life growing up, he says about two years ago, Jerome converted to Islam and had a new drive. I was like, you're about to get out of here, you know, especially when the cash money uh, offer came on the table and things of that sort. I was like, Youngin, this is shot. This is this, the opportunity. That rise was clipped short last night when Jerome near this gas station on Airline Highway. Because I think some people just gets kind of jealous that they see that somebody's about to actually, you know, make it. Patterson thinks Jerome was targeted while he's waiting to secure a deposit for a future performance. Came to get a deposit for a show and, and then all of a sudden some guys just roll up on him. I'm quite sure they knew that they was coming to, you know, do what they did toward him. You know? As the details emerge, fans and friends like Patterson's daughter Amari says the community will truly miss an artist like BTY Youngin. One thing about him, he wasn't like, you know, selfish. He wasn't one of those people like, I'm coming up, I'm gonna forget the people. He was willing to like give back to his people in New Orleans. In Terrytown, Jacqueline Quinn, Eyewitness News. And Jerome, also known as BTY Youngin, had just welcomed a baby girl this year. Police have not arrested anyone in connection. The year is 2019. Chantel Edwards walks slowly into a New Orleans courtroom. She begins weeping before she can make it to the witness stand. She was there to testify against one of her children. Chantel would insist that the charges against her son, Whitney, who was an upcoming artist affiliated with Lil Wayne, hadn't changed the way she felt about him. Trembling with anxiety, Chantel's last word before taking a stand would be, I love my children with all of my heart. This is the story of Whitner, a.k.a. Flo. Whitner, son of Chantel Edwards, was born in 1991. As an adolescent, Whitner would come up in the New Orleans East. Although not one of the housing projects or hoods in the inner city, the East was about that life. Whitner had a talent that talent would be rapping, earning him the moniker Flo. It is this talent that Whitner hoped will remove him from the streets. In 2008, Flo will release the mixtape How to Grind, Volume 2, featuring fellow New Orleans artists, D.Y. and Skits. Flo will go on to start his own music group, The Flames, and launch his own label, Flame Gang Music, with 12 Shoddy and Slim Boogie, bringing on Neo 
Da Vinci as the producer. In 2009, Flo will release his own mixtape, Heroic, Volume 1, under the moniker Flo, the E-Show Hero, on Flame Game Music. Lil Wayne, who is no stranger to mixtapes, will give Flo a feature on his Sorry for the Wake project. Flo, who was being managed at the time, will go crazy on a track titled Incredibles, featuring Tiat, Thugger, Raw Dizzy, and Chris Flo. Wayne would ultimately sign Flo to Young Money Records in August of 2012. Flo will release his second mixtape, Wolf. The tracks will be produced by Neo Da Vinci on Flame Game Music by way of Young Money Entertainment and Cash Money Records. In 2013, Flo would collaborate with New Orleans singer Chris Radke. They would go on to release the mixtape, Brothers from Another Color. In March of 2014, Flo would appear on the song, Fresher Than Ever, with Jay Mills, Gutta Gutta, Chris Flo, Birdman, and Mac Main. On the Young Money compilation album, Young Money, Rise of an Empire. In June of 2014, Flo will release his third mixtape, Withdrawals, on Flame Game Music by way of Young Money Entertainment and Cash Money Records. Let's rewind. It's July of 2013. Flo will be arrested for attempted first-degree crushing in Chalmette and two counts of Jackie. Flo will be arrested in Oakland, California by U.S. Marshals and return to Chalmette for prosecution after waiving extradition. It is rumored that Flo fled to California after arrest warrants alleged that he bust at and narrowly missed his ops on April 29th. Flo allegedly had beaten and jacked two men of cash in their cell phones. Flo will be released from the St. Bernard Paris Sheriff's Office in December of 2013. Jonathan Evans, a.k.a. LaJoe, was born and raised in the New Orleans East. LaJoe would start hustling and toning that iron at the age of 14. LaJoe's mother was a Vic, and his father was deceased. By the ninth grade, Jonathan Evans, a.k.a. LaJoe, had dropped out of school. LaJoe would look up to two dudes, Harold Martin, the hustler out the hood, and Flo. Jonathan would idolize Flo, being that he was associated with Lil Wayne. On May 11, 2015, Lil Joe, Damian Lil D. Crockham Jr. and Harold would be chilling in the 6200 block of Painter Street when the Red Buick with three men inside would pull up down the block. They would watch as the men hopped out the driver would be carrying a cutter. Lil D, Lil Joe, and Harold would all hop in a hottie that Lil Joe was driving and make their way to Lil D's crib in the 2500 block of Pinterest Avenue. Lil D and Harold would hop out of the whip. Lil Joe, who was the strap, would slump down in his seat to avoid being seen. Moments later, shots would sound off. Harold would be hit up and collapse in the 2500 block of Mendez Street. Rolandas Campbell will be accused of taking part in the crime. On the morning of May 25th, 2015, brothers Kendrick and Kendrick Bishop will be sitting inside a Kia sedan on Bright Drive in the New Orleans East. They both had rolled back with Flo and Lil Joe from a Lil Wayne concert in Mobile, Alabama. Lil Joe and Kendrick Bishop would ride in the back seat while Flo rode up front with Kendrick who drove. Upon making it back to the city, they would make a stop. Unbeknownst to the brothers, Flo and Lil Joe would pick up toolies when that stop was made. Right before the incident, the men would stop at a gas station on Shelf Highway. Flo would go inside to buy rolling papers. Lil Joe would go in the store behind Flo shortly after. After leaving the store, the men would drive towards Bright Drive and Pressburg Street towards Flo's mom's crib. When the whip came to a complete stop, Flo would hop out immediately. Flo would ask Lil Joe, who would hop out immediately after him, that the chopper have one in the chamber. Both men will walk back to the car and pretend they were getting back in. Flo will go up to the passenger side and just start busing. Not wanting to get hit, Lil Joe would walk to the back and start busing. After unloading, Flo would run away towards his mom's crib on the damn drive. Lil Joe would follow. The men were two blocks away from Flo's mom's crib when Flo would frantically start looking for his phone, yelling that he must have dropped it at the scene. Lil Joe would run back to the scene looking for the phone, but was unable to find it. Not wanting to be seen, he would run back to Flo's mom's crib. Surveillance video that would capture the incident showed two men running from the scene. One man would return, look inside and around the whip before running back off. Again, Flo 
who would show back up to the scene while police were investigating would tell one of the detectives that his phone was on the ground next to the car. Flo, who had agreed to talk to detectives at the MOBD headquarters, will become a suspect after questioning. Flo would tell inconsistent stories to detectives during the interview that didn't match what he told the officer on the scene. Learning more this afternoon about the rapper arrested in Baton Rouge accused of a double Orleans East. The suspect is 23-year-old Widner Flo DeGroy. According to reports, he's signed to Lil Wayne's Young Money Entertainment label. The suspect faces two counts of second degree in connection to the two brothers in New Orleans on Memorial Day. Reports indicate another 18-year-old suspect in this case was arrested over the weekend. When New Orleans police officers came to her door on Memorial Day of 2015, they would tell Chantel Edwards her son might have been involved in a double crushing around the corner. Surprised by them showing up, Chantel Edwards would say that she had no idea that her son left two gats under a pile of clothes on his bed. Flo, who was stopped by his mom's house before 6 a.m., told her that someone had tried to rob him. In court, Chantel would admit to hearing shots just before Flo came to her door, but couldn't recall how much time had passed between the time she heard gunshots and when Flo knocked on her door. Chantel would speak tearfully from the witness stand in criminal district judge Tracy Fleming's courtroom. Her son Witten would be on trial connected to the mate. 25th of 2015, crushing of brothers Kendrick Kirby Bishop and Kendrick Muddy Cup Buddy Bishop. Kendrick and Flo, both rappers, had recorded music together while Flo was signed to Lil Wayne's Young Money record label. The Bishop brothers were deleted while sitting inside a black Kia Cadenza in the 4800 block of Bright Drive, which is about a quarter mile from the home of Chantel in the 4900 block of Nottingham Drive in New Orleans East. It was alleged that the brothers went with the move on eight racks and a few blicks, which would trigger Flo to retaliate. Upon NOPD leaving her house on May 25th, Chantel would go to Flo's room where she would find two tools on Flo's bed under a pile of clothes. Panicking and frantically scared, Chantel would yell for her husband to come to Flo's room. He would grab the comforter along with everything on top of it, throw it in the back of his truck and get rid of them. This would not be the end. NOPD would come back later that day with search warrants. No questions would be asked. A search of Chantel's home would ensue. Afraid for Flo's life, Chantel would not inform the NOPD that she had removed two gats earlier. It wouldn't be long before Chantel would be indicted. Chantel would plead guilty to being an accessory after the fact. According to Chantel's deal, she would be able to withdraw her plea to a felony charge and plead guilty to Mr. Meter aiding and abetting if she continued to cooperate with the law. Flo would be sentenced Tuesday, May the 14th, to life in prison for the 2015 crushing of Brothers Kendrick and Kendrick Bishop in New Orleans East. 27 at the time, Flo would be convicted April 28th of two counts of second degree in conspiracy to commit second degree. Jewelry would deliberate about an hour and a half before convicting Flo with an 11 to 1 verdict. Earlier in the case, Flo would plead guilty to obstruction of justice and conspiracy to obstruct justice. Witten's attorney's efforts to have the case dismissed would fall on deaf ears. Flo would be sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Street famous, street famous. Street famous. In 1937, New Orleans would become the first city in the United States to benefit under the Wagner Act. Florida Avenue development was the fourth of six low-rent public housing developments in New Orleans that were funded by the Wagner Bill. Under the provisions of the contract signed with the United States Housing Authority, the Florida Avenue development was to be used exclusively for white veterans of World War II and was to revert to the local housing authority after the conflict was over. Built in 1946, the Florida would be constructed on 18.5 acres of land founded by Florida Avenue and North Durgeon Wall. Maison and Gallagher Streets in the Upper Ninth Ward, resembling most public housing complexes with 47 two and three story brick buildings for a total of 734 units housing 1,297 residents. The Florida apartments will be arranged around courtyards that were largely isolated from the rest of the community. Originally built for whites, the Florida would be desegregated by the 1970s, becoming a predominantly black project. In the mid 90s, 
Florida and nearby Desire Project was dubbed as the most troubled housing projects in the nation. In 1994, the Florida will record the highest deletion rate out of all handled developments with 26 crushing, surpassing the 13 smashings in the Desire, which previously held the highest record a year before. Majority of the Florida crushings in 94 were fueled by turf feuds. The deletion spike in the Florida and the Desire contributed to the city becoming the crushing capital of America. That year, the city's deletion rate would reach 424 crushings. 47 of those smashings would occur in Hano developments. In 2013, Housing Authority of New Orleans Administrative Receiver David Gilmore would announce at a Hano's board meeting being held February 19th that the Housing Authority had been awarded a construction contract to park class of builders for 51 new units where Florida once stood. The $13.1 million project will be funded with $8.3 million in FEMA dollars and $4.8 in capital funding due to a federal approve. After more than four years working to overhaul the Housing Authority of New Orleans, David Gilmore will step down as the federal government's overseer of the agency, clearing the way for the once troubled agency to return to local control. The year is 1994. The date is June 2nd. Rodney Temple will be indicted. Rodney will enter a plea of not guilty at his arraignment on June 30th of 1994. August 26th of 1994, Rodney will file discovery and suppression motions. A suppression hearing will be held on June 30th, 1995. The trial court will deny Rodney's motions to suppress statements and evidence. Rodney will be found guilty and charged after a jury trial on April 22nd of 1996. May 6th of 1996, Rodney will be sentenced to life imprisonment at our labor without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. This is the story of Edgar Gibbons, a.k.a. Pimp Daddy. Edgar Gibbons, better known to the city as Pimp Daddy, would be a pioneer in bringing New Orleans bounce music to the world. His smash hit, Got To Be Real, on Full Pack Records, would have clubs and bars rocking. Pimp, who didn't have a whip at the time, would show up to local bars in the hood and rock the mic. Pimp's harmonizing style was unique and original. Dwayne Carter, a.k.a. Lil Wayne, would idolize Pimp as a kid, initially going by the name Shrimp Daddy. In 1994, Pimp would release his debut album with up-and-coming record label at the time, Cash Money Records. Pimp, however, would not get to enjoy the success of his debut album. His life would be taken in 1994. It's 5.30 a.m. the morning of April 18, 1984. NOPD officer Lynn Major and his partner, Mark Delpit, are responding to a battery call at 3620. Florida Avenue. Upon reaching the third floor of the building, the officers would observe the front door partially open. Not knowing what was on the other side and hesitant to barge in, the officers would peep inside the apartment and see an identified man in an upright position on the sofa with his arm folded and head back. Upon getting a closer look, the officers would realize that the unidentified man had been crushed. The man would be later identified as 18-year-old Edgar Gibbons of New Orleans, aka Pimp Daddy. The NOPD would speak with Nakuisha Gray and Quincy Temple, the uncle of the apartment owner, Kim Temple. Quincy would testify that he and his girlfriend, Nakisha Gray, went to the house of Kim on Monday with Rodney Temple. They would arrive at approximately 9 p.m., all planning to spend the night. Later that night, they would all eat pizza and go to sleep. Quincy and Aquisha would sleep in their bedroom. Rodney would sleep on the living room sofa. Awakened by shots, Quincy and Aquisha would run to the living room. They would find Edgar on the sofa. He had been crushed. Rodney would be nowhere in sight. Quincy and Aquisha would run to Quincy's mother's house and call the NOPD. Quincy, Aquisha, and Rodney would all return to Kim's apartment and give statements to the NOPD. Rodney's mother would arrive on the scene later that morning. Kim Temple would testify that she resided at 3620 Florida Avenue. Edgar, who she would identify as her ex boyfriend had lived there with her at some point. At the time Edgar was deleted, Kim would tell the NOPD that she was living with her mother, alleging that she and Edgar had gotten into an argument and broke up. Kim would tell the NOPD that Edgar would always put hands on her. Kim would go on to say that the day before Edgar was deleted, he would take her keys to the apartment and ram Chad the apartment. Upon receiving Rodney Temple's statement, he would be placed in the back of the police car. Rodney would confess to smashing Edgar, going on to say that he hit Edgar up five times and left the scene to stash the blicky. Rodney would show the NOPD where he stashed the toolie. The NOPD would retrieve the gat from under the porch at 3613 North Thurgeonwall Street. Rodney would be taken to NOPD headquarters 
where he would refuse to make any further statements. Rodney's mom, Helen Temple, would testify that on the morning of April 19, 1994, the NOPD would arrive to her home and ask her to go with them. Upon arriving on the scene, Rodney would already be in the back of the police car. It was then that the NOPD would inform her that Rodney had deleted Edgar. Miss Helen and Rodney would both be taken to headquarters where Rodney would confess to his mom that he smashed Edgar. Miss Helen would go on to say that she had no knowledge of Rodney having a history of violence, but she did, however, know that he was always strapped. Rodney would testify that Pimp, who was dating his cousin Kim, would always put hands on her. It is alleged that the day before Rodney would delete Pimp, Kim had called the NOPD to report that Pimp had broken into her apartment and destroyed the apartment. It is alleged that Rodney would help Kim clean up the apartment. On the evening of April 18, 1984, Rodney, Quincy, and Akisha would go to Kim's apartment. Rodney would allege that during the night, he would sense someone standing over him, which would awaken him. Upon looking up, he would realize that Pimp was standing over him. Rodney would go on to say that a scuffle would ensue, alleging that Pimp would grab him and sling him off the sofa, grabbing him by his neck. Rodney, who would stash his strap under the sofa, would reach and grab it. They would struggle over the blicky. Rodney would wrestle Pimp down to the sofa, grab his blicky, and delete Pimp. Rodney would flee the scene and wouldn't return until the next day, after the NOPD had been called. On June 2nd, 1994, Rodney Temple would be indicted for second degree. Rodney would be found guilty and charged after a jury trial on April 22nd, 1996. May 6th of 1996, Rodney would be sentenced to life imprisonment at hard labor without benefit of probation, parole, or suspension of sentence. This was the story of Edgar Givens, AKA Pimp Daddy.